I'm Julie Bartolotto. I'm the executive director of the Historical Society. The Historical Society is a nonprofit organization, and we are dedicated to the collection and preservation of historical materials, and we do a variety of programs to share the information contained in our archive with the public, like exhibitions and public programs like this one. Much, much attention has been paid to World War II veterans, but over half the population were not permitted to serve in the same way, and they served this country in many other ways. Tonight, we'll focus on women who worked in the local Douglas plant building airplanes. Kay Briegel always says that the United States won the war because we could manufacture more airplanes than Germans, and Long Beach and women had a huge part to play in that. I'd like to introduce one of the historians on this project, the Long Beach Remembers Pearl Harbor Project, Dr. Craig Hendricks, and the secretary of the Historical Society of Long Beach Board of Directors. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, welcome, I'm glad you're here tonight for this talk. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jerry Shipsky, who's going to uh, provide most of the entertainment tonight. We'll have a slideshow, and then we'll do some questions and answers afterwards. That's the general schedule. So let me just inter introduce my longtime and good friend, Jerry Shipsky, who you know, has a tremendous uh, record of pu public service in Long Beach. She was, uh, did a stint on the Long Beach City College Board of Trustees, survived that. And two terms on the Long Beach City Council, survived that. And now she's turned herself into a, uh, a one-person history machine, churning out uh, lots of interesting uh, books about various historical topics in Long Beach. And here is a sampling here with these books. And she also has just finished up, or in the process of finishing up, it's done, it's it's done an online book uh, called Remarkable Women of Long Beach, in which she has profiled 93 uh, Long Beach women and the contribution they made, not just to Long Beach history, but to US history and, in a sense, world history as well. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, I think we'll get on with the program and have Jerry should do the slideshow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig, and thank you, Julie, and most importantly, thank you, Historical Society of Long Beach. You do a wonderful job in preserving the history of my hometown and certainly the town that many came to for a variety of reasons over the years. Um, and it's just wonderful to see this exhibit. Um, I would tell you that if you're interested, most of those photographs are on the wall are in my book um, because they all come from Douglas Aircraft and we're going to have some fun tonight talking about the women of Long Beach um, who lived here, came here um, to get a job during World War II. So let me cue up. Okay, most of us may not know where the term Rosie the Riveter comes from. It's not one person. It was an affectionate collective term that was given to women after the four vagabonds who were an African-American quartet performed the song on the radio. <laughs> So when that song came out, and we're going to talk a little bit later, um, the illustrator Norman Rockwell heard that song. Um, and we'll take a look at the front page that he did for the Saturday um, Evening Post that launched again in people's minds the icon of naming the women who had left their homes to go work on the, on the uh, home front uh, for the war. There are about 23,000 women who worked right here in Long Beach at Douglas Aircraft Plant. Um, they accounted for probably about 60 to 70 percent of the workforce in the aircraft plant when it opened. Uh, it opened in October of 1940, and then um, 41, and what obviously happened just a couple of months later, we had Pearl Harbor, which is one of the reasons that we're here. The following year, when they had to ramp up and hire women, um, they were working them uh, a considerable amount of time producing the aircraft that 
Uh, many attribute to the reason that we were able to win the war. But we, I want to frame this in the sense of what was happening nationally, not only for women, but also for men when the war uh, broke out. And these industries that were called by uh, President Roosevelt, and you can see that they call them the arsenal of democracy, um, that they stepped up to step up the production of the needed things for a major war. So we saw a steady stream of propaganda that was coming out in the movies, in magazines, in the newspapers, all aimed at educating the populace that everyone had to work if they possibly could. And as a result, that's why in Long Beach we were able to have about 23,000 women who took jobs in the Douglas Aircraft Factory. I just have to say as an aside, and I was just saying to Craig, in this film it says, oh, that you know, women will be paid the same as men. Didn't happen. Did not happen. Shock. Um, and I'm in shocked. fact, later in the war, um, when the uh, Pullman Group, the African American Pullman Group, actually had threatened to um, do some boycotts and, and cause some disruption in some of the work sites, uh, Roosevelt decided to write an executive order and he said that all should be paid the same while they're working um, during the war. But he wasn't all women and men, it was all men. So the men's salaries went up, but the women um, stayed substantially under what a male would make for the same work. The women, interestingly enough, worked in teams, and what had happened um, as a result of uh, Henry Ford making the Model T is that he introduced into this country the assembly line concept. Uh, prior to that, airplanes and, and automobiles and everything else were made one at a time. Um, the assembly line required that people work together because when your part of what you had to do moved on, it better have been done because you had to go with it down to the next um, in line. So there was um, a lot of camaraderie with the women. They worked in teams. Um, just a bit of language trivia. The riveter was the person who used what was called um, the Buck Rogers gun because Buck Rogers was a science fiction character in the movies. Um, and she pushed through the rivet into the hole, and on the other side would be somebody who would push back, and they were called a bucker. And they were the person who flattened out the rivets um, for the planes or when they did rivets in the, for the ships. By the way, it took 165,000 rivets to put one airplane together. And that's why they needed so many people. Um, the, uh, the airplanes they were putting together, they were putting A-20s and A-26s, which were light attack bombers that had been mostly used in um, France and in England. And then obviously we started to use them. And then they moved into the B-17, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes. But on average, there was about 150,000 parts to the plane, and they had, they were all riveted together. Um, so you can imagine the amount of people you needed to be able to have that um, happen very safely. As a consequence of the effectiveness of the women's team and the fact that they did assembly work here at Douglas Aircraft, they were able to produce about 16 bombers a day seven days a week. Um, I don't know if we have a picture here, but it's in the book that because their production was so high, Franklin Roosevelt actually came to Long Beach. And as you know, where the, the plant was, on Cherry Avenue, there was a railroad spur, and that was one of the reasons that Douglas picked that place so that they could get goods in and out of um, the factory. They, the president came on train and was offloaded from train into a car and then brought in to meet the women who had produced so many planes on behalf of the United States. As a result, when you hear the Rosie the Riveter song and they talk about she got her production E, it is a silver um, um, pin that they got and a little card that said that they had been part of the production uh, group that had met the federal production standards at the time. So they were very, it was very important to them that this happened. Um, years ago, and we'll talk at the end about Rosie the Riveter Park, I actually had um, a woman come to me whose mother had the 
the silver pin and she gave it to me. Um, and we used it in the foundation, the Rosie Bitter Foundation, to give to those who we've honored as we can do it. Um, because that pin was extremely important to the women who work there. They got the pin, they got a card, but also they were able to put a flag up um, in the facility that showed that they had met the top production quotas. And so Roosevelt came out here um, to acknowledge them um, that they had done that. The B-17, um, which I find very interesting, is also called the Flying Fortress. It's a very large airplane. It was also called the ladies' plane. Um, and the reason it was, it was because it was made by all women. Um, interesting side story, what happened is some of the uh, men in Congress, which were mostly men in Congress, um, started to complain that the B-17 was expensive to build. And so they had, they had said, well, we're not going to fund it. So the Army Air Corps, which then became the Army Air Force, uh, went about having um, a mass propaganda campaign with Hollywood. They hired um, Lieutenant Clark Gable um, and others, and they put out films, particularly about the Memphis Bell. The Memphis Bell was the name given to the B-17 that uh, survived all kinds of gunfire and, and bombing raids. Um, and so what was occurring was not only saying it was too expensive to produce, but it wasn't a safe plane because it was made by women. And so there was a big pushback. Not only are these women out there, you know, working and putting these planes together and, and giving up a lot of their own personal lives. The same thing happened with the women who worked in the Kaiser shipyards. Um, some families complained they didn't want their, they would write Congress people, they didn't want their husbands on the, the ships because they were made by women and that obviously they were going to sink. They didn't sink. Um, so women had it, you know, they got it both ways. They, 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 they got the pressure about having to go and work on the home front. In the same hand, their work was not necessarily nationally appreciated. Because of the Memphis Bell, because of the movies and such, the B-17 was turned around and it became one of the favorites of um, the Army Air Corps as well as, and Congress fu funded it. <clears throat> as I mentioned, women worked 11 to 12 hours a day um, six to seven days a week, assembling, doing a variety of things, uh, welding. Welders got paid slightly more than 85 cents an hour, but that's what they got. Um, and there's an interesting film that the women, uh, that they've put out for the women who worked in the Kaiser shipyards up in Richmond. Um, this was particularly a, a beneficial time for African American women who were not able to get other kind of employment when we were not at war. They had to do housekeeping. Um, and maid service and things like that. When they were able to work in the war, this was a meaningful paycheck for them um, that once the war was over, it was taken back. They were not allowed to have those jobs anymore. For other women, there were many women who had never worked outside the home, so this was a meaningful paycheck for them as well, even though it was only 85 cents. Um, and they worked extremely hard. They had a, a number of medical problems associated with working, riveting, standing, squatting, um, doing all kinds of things. The, the rivet gun was um, powered by air pressure. And it's funny, there is a thing I have in my book about, Douglas put an ad out for the women and it said, if you can iron, you can rivet. Because actually the iron was, was heavier than the rivet gun. But what they didn't talk to you about was once it got hooked up to air pressure, it battered women tremendously. They were black and blue from the pressure. Um, they had terrible back problems. They um, wound up losing their menstrual cycle sometime because they were standing for so long of a period of time. No, they didn't get bathroom breaks. This is very interesting. When the federal government contracted with Douglas to make airplanes, they said, well, we didn't include money in there for bathroom breaks. And the women said, uh, we've, this is a problem because women started to develop some urinary problems because of it. So Douglas gave women bathroom breaks and a half hour lunch period. And so the men complained. And so the men got it too. Um, because you have to understand during the war, uh, Douglas was not unionized. Douglas did not become unionized until um, after the war was over. So they didn't have any way to collectively bargain with with Douglas, um, and so then consequently everybody got a little bit more humane treatment. Um, Douglas went out and hired matrons 
to work in the factories who um, had an office next to the bathroom, and you could go in and talk to the matron. You know, if you were having family problems, if you needed an aspirin, if you needed a button sewed on. They also had female counselors, um, twofold. One, because they felt a lot of the women were having difficulties adjusting to work, um, and that they had the family that perhaps a husband, a brother, uh, others who were at war and the stress of, of what was going on there. So he was, he had, Douglas had some foresight about taking care of people. He did not provide on-site child care like they did up in uh, Richmond. Um, the Long Beach Day Nursery down here provided a lot of the daycare, um, provided um, a lot of private homes had daycare as well. Um, and that mo the movie that where they showed about the hot beds, they called them hot cots, um, there was a lot of that in Long Beach because people came from everywhere to try to get these jobs because we had just come out of a depression and they were looking for employment. And as you could see from the manpower report, they were having great difficulties recruiting people. So they were taking everybody that would come in. Unfortunately, Long Beach did not have sufficient housing. Um, so it was very difficult for people to come and to get a place to stay, and they often shared quarters. We had a particularly difficult time um, with Douglas was more integrated than other places. A lot of African Americans came in to take jobs. And unfortunately, Long Beach, because of its connection with the KKK and some other problems, um, would not allow African Americans to live but in certain sections. And so that's why we see a real influx of African Americans going to Carson and Wilmington and other places because Long Beach really ha had very restrictive covenants um, and restricted the areas where people could live if they were African American. Top of women making 85 cents an hour, women were expected to take 10% of their paycheck and buy war bonds. Uh, war bonds, um, actually kids in school were expected to buy war stamps, and so many stamps then would equate you could buy a bond. Um, our local high schools are actually in the National Archives, there's a photo that's also in my book, where the, the, our high schools got together and they raised money and bought a bomber. They paid for a bomber. It's about $185,000. Um, what I don't have in my book that was also kind of interesting, but uh, newspaper um, articles are very interesting about how the way to raise money is they would take pieces of shot down Japanese planes and they would take them to schools all around Long Beach and they'd have big ads and they'd say, come and see, you know, the plane that was shot down. And then that would encourage people to buy war stamps or war bonds. So it was a concerted effort in the city. Everybody was doing it um, as a way to fund the war, not only by working, but then having to contribute a portion of your money. <clears throat> For those of you who are like me and over 60, never complain that you can't work during World War II. I found actually a woman uh, who worked for Douglas. She was 84 years old. Um, and she did piecemeal work. They, um, they had sub, subcontractors and she was in. But we see a lot of women in their 60s and older working full time in these plants, doing the heavy, dirty work that was required of people um, to assemble planes. That there were no safety rules. There were no safety rules whatsoever. And there were more injuries in some of the factories than there were on the battlefield because um, there were more people um, collectively working in, in different factories, but um, eye injuries, the tools were not made for women's hands, so they often could not hold them properly. They couldn't wear the gloves because the gloves were too big. They couldn't wear the goggles because they were made for males. And so consequently, they exposed themselves to um, a lot of injury. And as the narrator indicated, that's not been talked about very much when we report about World War II, about all uh, the industrial injuries that took place um, as a consequence of the war. So you get these women to come to work at Douglas and, and what starts happening is rumor is we're going, the war is going to be over or most uh, poignantly for people's lives. Life goes on. They had children. They had a house to take care of. They perhaps maybe lost a spouse. They lost a family member, and so it was very difficult for women to sustain their employment. And one of the things that Douglas and others complained about is that 
the absentee rate was very high because these are mothers. These are women who have to do other things. Interesting story about Long Beach. You could not go shopping or banking on Saturday and Sunday. So the Douglas made an arrangement with some of the stores in Long Beach, Buffums and others, to, to stay open so that women would have an opportunity at some point to go shopping because otherwise they wouldn't be able to do anything. They also, they also arranged that you could go get your, you know, you can get your paycheck, um, and they stopped that on the weekend because they found they would come and get their paycheck and then they'd go away. Um, so they, they stopped doing that. So they had to adjust to what was going on in the war, but it was as extremely stressful for people's personal lives as well as what was happening uh, on the work site. So they had to engage in a, this is my favorite poster, I think it is just beautiful. Um, they engaged in developing more more and more posters. Posters were an easy way. They stuck them up every place. They were inexpensive. Um, and you've got several samples over here. It was a way to engage people. Um, and the key was, you know, you need to come and work in the factory. Uh, some married women had problems with their husbands. Their husbands did not want them working in the factory. And so you'll see many posters out there where it says, my husband is proud of me, I'm working at the factory. They tried to get over the objection that somehow if she went to the factory, um, she would be less feminine, um, and that somehow she would be taking over the place of her husband as the breadwinner. So I'll talk about safety for one quick second. The reason we have the polka dot bandana, or what developed is actually called the snood, which held the hair in place, was, as you can see this photograph, this woman's hair is wrapped around the machinery. There were instances of women being scalped, um, being electrocuted because the hair uh, acted as a conduit, so they came up with the snood, and then you started to see all the movie stars wearing their hair a certain way, and it was because they wanted to make it fashionable that that's what you're supposed to, your attire is supposed to be like. Um, and that nurse was sent out to check to see if the person really was sick. Um, because they wanted the person back at work. They needed the physical body there. Um, and so while it, it sounded like it was great and it was kind of occupational health, it really wasn't. Um, it, and they had no health care coverage um, down here in the Long Beach area. Um, that was something that was started at the Kaiser plant. Um, it was started with Kaiser and Henry Garfield, um, whose wife came up with a interesting name. So let's name it Permanente. So that's where it came, Kaiser Permanente. Um, and after the war, for two dollars per person per month, Kaiser paid for the health care of the people there because he was smart. He figured out if they were well and they could go to the doctor there on site, he wouldn't lose pr uh, productive time. One thing Douglas did down here was though he gave out vitamins um, because there are two big problems when the war broke out um, in the United States. People were illiterate and they were um, malnourished. Um, and one of the problems here in Long Beach we had about the illiteracy, that's why the Long Beach adult education grew so much, is that they had to teach many of the enlisted on how to read basic orders because they were not literate when they were drafted in. A lot of young men had not even completed sixth or seventh grade and had enlisted. So. The schools took up that to try to um, provide <coughs> education on that point. Douglas gave out vitamins. He also started the concept of a cafeteria at work um, because they would be able to provide a hot meal for inexpensive cost. Their newsletters they gave out to the employees had page after page about how to put a good meal in a thermos and bring that to work um, because, again, the focus was we need you to eat because if you don't eat, you're not going to be able to sustain the hard work um, that we need you to do 11, 12 hours a day. So women um, took the cue and that's why you see a lot of um, the workers dressed in that way. Um, as a side note, when that woman went from very nicely dressed with jewelry and makeup and all that stuff, um, 
you'll see in some of the photographs uh, at the Library of Congress where these do come from, that the women have makeup and they have jewelry and they're working. Those were models. Those were models that were brought into Douglas by the Office of War Information to d do photo shoots for the propaganda. When they came to work, they were told they couldn't have makeup, they couldn't have jewelry, and they, they really wound up wearing mostly men's pants and men's shoes um, and because they didn't want to get caught in the machinery. Um, so the posters show these gorgeous, beautiful women working uh, when in fact the reality was they were dirty and they didn't look like that. As a consequence, one of the things Douglas did in the newsletters for the employees, he hired uh, Helena Rubenstein, who was uh, at that time a, a beauty guru, and she would write articles about how women could keep their femininity while working all day in a very dirty job. So they would have tips of what you could do about greasing your hands up with cold cream um, and preventing the grease and other things from getting embedded. It didn't work, but it was an attempt to try to make sure that women understood that they could remain feminine. Um, I mentioned earlier, Douglas Aircraft actually really um, was more integrated than any place else. Craig Shipyards was very difficult for women to work there, very difficult for African Americans to have jobs there. Douglas has considered itself to be a melting pot, and that's what the captions say in the Library of Congress about these photographs about Douglas. I have to tell you quickly how I found this out. It wasn't like I just decided I want to go research Rosie the Riveter. Um, when I was in council, and then we, there's a park um, over at Conant and Clark called Doug, it was called C Douglas Park. And so the Boeing company, before it left, wanted to be able to put a new Douglas Park at Lakewood Boulevard. And the city says you can't have two parks named for the same person. So in my youth, I had uh, known Sherna Gluck and at Cal State Long Beach um, and um, people like Kay Briggle and others who um, were very instrumental, um, but Scherner wrote a book called Rosie the Riveter Revisited, and I vaguely kind of knew what was in there. I also knew that she'd utilized students to do the oral histories, which if you want to hear some wonderful oral histories, Cal State Long Beach has them online, and they're women who worked at Douglas during World War II. Um, and so I thought, well, why don't we just, you know, why don't we name this park Rosie the Riveter Park, since I had heard Richmond was, was trying to open up a park, and I said, if Richmond can do it, Long Beach can do it. So we named it Rosie the Riveter. And doing research, I was trying to look for stuff for the grand opening and things, and I went on the Library of Congress and typed in Long Beach, uh, women, World War II. Hundreds of photographs came up in beautiful Kodachrome color and also in black and white, and they were all from Long Beach. And I thought, oh, this makes it even more important that we do something to recognize um, the women who worked here. Um, and, and that's where these photographs come from, and that's where my focus came from, because once I started to discover the wonderful work they did here, um, when we did finally did get the park, um, I'll never forget a former Rosie, uh, who has passed, came up and with tears in her eyes, and I said, what's the matter? And she said, I never thought anyone would re remember what we did. And so that was very poignant to me because that's what this is all about. That's what the historic society does, historical society does. It's remembering what people did uh, that, made the, that made our community what it is. So married women were so reluctant to take jobs and stay there that Douglas offered the Boy Scouts in Long Beach to go out and recruit 6,000 new workers. And the troop that brought in the most filled out applications would get a cash prize. They also used Boy Scouts, by the way, to go door to door to collect tin and paper um, and um, your fat. Not your personal fat, the fat. <laughs> Although there is a song, and I was listening to it back today, it's called Scrap Your Fat, and it wasn't just about the collection of fat from meat, it was about this woman was told to scrap her fat so she could get into the Women's Air um, Corps. So they sent these Boy Scouts out. The Boy Scouts were involved in going door to door, and they did quite a job. And it was, again, trying to convince married women, because all the single women had already gone to work. It was the married women they were having difficulty to come back into the workforce. And Long Beach teachers were offered an opportunity. You could work all day teaching and then go work a shift at night at Douglas, and they did. 
Um, and then you could work a victory summer. You could work all summer in the plant, which they did, and they ran these <laughs> ads. <laughs> they ran these ads. Um, what they did uh, for education in Long Beach was that if you were a male and you were 16 and older, you didn't have to go to high school. You could actually go work at Douglas Aircraft. The women had to be 18 and older um, to be able to do that. And many young men were you know, kind of fudging on their age anyway, and so they were going into the, the military. And I want to mention a little bit about the men. You see men periodically in these pictures. Um, the men that were in the factories were mostly older men, or they were men that had medical deferments of some kind, or they had um, deferments because what they did was essential. And there are instances where some of these guys went to try to enlist, and they got arrested by the FBI because they were listed as essential, and they were brought back to the plant and told, this is where you have to work. You cannot enlist. Um, so there, there was a, and there were young men who were waiting to, to become the age that they could enlist, so they would take the jobs as well um, in the factory. Working women, again, had a lot to do in their lives. They were expected to keep house, write letters, save the fat. And the fat, by the way, was used to make nitroglycerin. Fat from meat made explosives. Um, and so that's why they asked people to collect it. And there, there developed a huge black market for it because you were supposed to sell it back to your butcher. The butcher was supposed to sell it to the rendering company that made it into nitroglycerin, and there became a big... Um, um, market for it. I will tell you, there's articles that Long Beach had a fat quota, and it didn't. It didn't make it. It never made its fat quota. So I don't know what happened to the fat, but it, it went away. So Norman Rockwell's cover. This was the original Rosie the Riveter. This is the 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 icon that sparked with the song. He had heard the song that we've played, and as you can see on her lunch pail is Rosie. Um, she's got all kinds of the different badges that you would wear at work. Um, she actually has both uh, welding goggles and uh, a, a hat mask, which she's not supposed to have, but they did that. You, what you don't see is she's wearing uh, loafers and she's stepping on a copy of Mein Kampf. <laughs> So this was the iconic Rosie, the one that we know of, the poster that we see that says we can do it, came later. And it came, uh, it was from Westinghouse, and it was a production poster, and it was to encourage women to continue um, the work that they were doing. So women were told, and so were the men, the men were told, just, just bear with us, they're going to go away, they're going to go back home, don't worry about it, um, that they would go back home after the war. We also, at the very same time, I just have a couple more slides. At the very same time, we had here in Long Beach, on the Long Beach Airfield, um, we had a group of women called women, um, Women's Air Force Service Pilots, known as WASP. And they were stationed here uh, in Long Beach. Their job was, once the planes were finished, they flew them for the first time and then flew them off to air bases. Um, over the course of the time we had WASPs, 38 women died. They were not considered veterans. It took to the 70s before they got veterans benefits. And then just two years ago, uh, President Obama gave them a congressional gold medal um, for their service. Uh, it took a long time to recognize what the sacrifice and how dangerous this was. Barbara Harris in London, at the age of 24 years old, was the squadron commander. Um, and she just died recently. Her daughter was a pilot, was a pilot and, and her other daughter was very involved in, in Long Beach um, things. But Barbara, um, at 24 years old, commanded this group. She is at the furthest, at the top row where the arrow is. That's, that's Barbara. And she was the only WASP that was given an air medal because she had flown so many planes to so many locations over a small period of time that they gave her an air medal. All right, quickly, this is Betty Murphy. And Betty Murphy, after, um, well, during World War II, was a nurse's aide, decided to become uh, a worker at Douglas Aircraft, went to Douglas Aircraft, got a job. She became the first woman supervisor. Um, and after the war, she stayed at Douglas. Very few women were allowed to stay. She stayed. Um, she also um, helped. Um, get together the um, union, the UAW, and then she was elected president of the retirees. And I don't know if any of you ever met her, but she was a character. Um, she was really a tough 
tough woman. She is also on the oral history. So if you look up the oral histories at Cal State, she's one of them. Okay, so last but not least, the Rosie the Riveter Park that we have in Long Beach is one of two parks that recognizes the contributions of women who worked on the home front. Um, I really encourage you to visit. It's over at Clark and Conant. It's adjacent to the um, um, Long Beach City College, and it just steps away from where Douglas Aircraft was. Uh, it's, a, it's a really sweet, sweet park. March 21st just happened. We now have National Rosie the Riveter Day. Um, and our Congressman Alan Lowenthal was one of the co-sponsors um, because it, a House resolution doesn't have to be signed by the President. It went through. Um, and what happened at our Rosie the Riveter Park is that they planted what is called the Rosie the Riveter Rose. It, it will be out in January. You'll be able to get it at Armstrong and other places. Um, but we've added it to the Rose Garden that we, that we have there. And if you just bear with me one second. This woman right here, by the way, this is Eleanor Otto. Eleanor is 97 years old. She retired from Boeing two years ago at 95. She riveted all the way up till 95. And, and let, me, let me tell you a cute, quick story because it has to do with Eleanor. I got contacted by a gentleman um, from, in England. Um, in, he lives in a community called Tally Ho Farm. And that what they had done is in 1943, one of the B-17 bombers uh, came back from Germany and crashed and burned in their field, in their town. And the townspeople rescued everybody. Everybody survived out of the crash. That's how durable the B-17 was. So most of the debris was taken away. This man is in his late 60s, 70s, and he went out and he's a metal detector and he started to find pieces of spent ammunition and pieces of the bomber. And he spent, uh, I think, about a year tracing where that bomber came from. It came from Long Beach, California in the Douglas Aircraft plant. And so he contacted me because we're online with uh, lbrosie.com and he said, I've got a surprise for you. He said, we found fragments, and I have it up here and you guys can see it. We, we found fragments and they are in the shape, you're not gonna believe this, of a Rosie the Riveter. And so can we have some rivets? So we got a hold of um, Boeing and Eleanor, and we sent the rivets over to them. So they used the rivets to hold the piece of metal. And then the other part of the story, it's on a wooden block. And the wood is from a tree, from a village where when that B-17 came down, it singed it and burned it. So what the people in England have done now is they've named that area Thanksgiving Field. And they've named this Thanksgiving Rose, which we're going to try to figure out how to get on display someplace because it is, it is very special. They are very grateful to the United States uh, for what we did in World War II. They are grateful for the women. He traced down the serial number of the plane, and that's how they knew it was done in Long Beach. And he said the women in Long Beach made that plane, and as a result, we were able to um, be freed from potential German tyranny, and we are forever grateful. Um, so. The history continues with, with us. Um, I encourage you to visit our park. It's wonderful. Um, and then and Craig's got some questions, but thank you. I'm glad you asked that question. OK, so let me do a few facts and figures, then we'll get back to that. Uh, during World War II, 31 million men between the ages of 18 and 44 are registered by local draft boards. Ultimately, about 15 million American men served in World War II. 700,000 African-American men put in segregated units until 1948. Over a million Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans served as well, most not in segregated units. Uh, the 442 Regimental Combat Team is the exception. 350,000 women enlisted in the armed services. 140,000 WACs, that's the Women Army Corps. Uh, 100,000 WAVES, that's the Navy version of that and about 2,000 WASPs, which is the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, of which we had a command in Long Beach. 75,000 registered nurses, which was one-third of the registered nurses total in the United States, served in the war. Um, seven million new jobs in defense factories opened by the summer of 1942. Of those seven million jobs, about three million went to American women. So uh, by 1945, women composed about 36% of the U.S. labor force. Uh, 
Um, pay discrimination continued, however. In shipyard work, women with the most seniority earned about $7 a day. Men could go as high as $22 a day. Now, what that translates to us is $7 would be $85 in our money and uh, 22 would be, would be $270. So there was a very wide pay discrepancy. Um, by the end of 1944, however, the government was beginning to urge w women to stay home or return home, and by 1947, the percent of women workers in the U.S. falls back to about 25%. However, and these are some of the interesting aspects of the war, and I'm sure Jerry will talk about this, about 25% of the new women workers decided to stay in the labor force after 1945, and that will create all sorts of interesting social and political and economic changes in American life. Okay, so 22-7 in the shipyards, and I, I assume the aircraft factories are pretty much the same. There were 17 aircraft factories in the Long Beach, Southern California area. Um, and by 1943, about half the workforce of 210,000 were, in fact, women. Um, and Douglas is considered one of the most uh, progressive of the airline manu uh, the aircraft manufacturers for the things that he did, although he would not permit unionization. So, do you have a question? Was Northam uh, or the union organized too? Um, halfway through the war, it began, to, it began to unionize, but only skilled workers not production line workers. In fact, Douglas used the Long Beach Police Department to beat the living crap out of the workers at Douglas who tried to organize the union. It was very, very brutal for many years. Uh, and that's why, when you t if you t ever talk to Betty, I mean, Betty had some interesting war stories about how difficult it was um, on the factory floor um, to even whisper about union um, because Douglas was, and Craig, John Craig and the Craig Shipyards, they were worse. They, they absolutely uh, would not tolerate anyone um, participating or even discussing um, labor unions. So, yes, after the war, women tried to stay. Um, their thought was when we went into the Korean War that Douglas was going to hire up again, but they didn't. And so they didn't hire up to the levels. And so there was yeah. never that mass employment opportunity that they had during the war. Um, and when we finish up, I want to show you just a quick thing. There is, there was such propaganda put out about now the war's over, honey. You better go home. A well, real woman, a real woman is in the house. Tell them the story about uh, payday at Douglas. Where people lined up on the field. Which one? Uh, late 1944. Um, I think it was the secretary. Uh, the secretary of war came to visit Long Beach, the Long Beach plant, for the same reason because it's high productivity. This was a Friday afternoon. And so all the workers were called out onto the tarmac and a speech, he gave a speech which he thanked more workers. And as he's speaking, uh, Douglas employees are circulating pay envelopes and in every pay envelope that was given to a woman was also a pink slip. Thank you for your service, now go home. Um, I don't know what to say about that in terms of the social reality of the 1930s and 1940s, but that's where we were. Um, Social change comes slowly, and this is an example of that. Well, and then there was mass marketing that was done, advertising. PR came into being. We didn't have public relations up until that time. Um, and so with the end of the war, we had PR pushing consumerism, buying stuff. There was a lot of leftover metal that no longer needed to be used for airplanes, so they were making refrigerators and stoves and women were shown in magazines with pearls and high heels mopping their floors um, it was that's what a woman needed to do the war is over we need you back here because the you know, unemployment for returning veterans was very high and so it was a battle now staged in the home as to does the woman get the job or does the husband who came from the war get the job? And so it created quite a bit of, um, of friction. In, in well, the yeah, and social change and the, the battle is going to go on for 30 or 40 years. Yeah. Still going on, but, yes, um, indeed. When did, when did Douglas actually unionize then? The late 50s, um, 60s. Um, the unionization movement starts in the early 50s, and by, I think, 1961, there is a, a recognized, federally recognized union among, among uh, machinists at Douglas. A very slow process. Because Uduak's mother, grandmother, talked about trying to, refusing to leave, being one of the last to be let go. But so was she 
No, 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 no. She was a shop steward. Yeah, but she must. She must have worked up to be the supervisor. Yeah, she probably was a supervisor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking of that, uh, Jerry did mention that a lot of people came into Cal into California and in the Long Beach area to work at these new aircraft factories and shipyards. This is when Long Beach's population went from 160,000 to 250,000. So this is the housing problem, the traffic problem, the school problem, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of these people are coming from the South and were absolutely illiterate, uh, white and black, right? And so, for example, my grandmother got a job at Douglas teaching literacy to workers arriving from the South. And she would often say when I was a kid, they couldn't even spell their names. And now they were using sophisticated machinery and technology to produce these aircraft. And so. There probably were there probably were five or six hundred teachers employed at Douglas Aircraft and other factories. Yeah, mm -hmm. think of a factory that has forty thousand workers or thirty nine thousand workers. You got to have and a lot of them are illiterate. Actually, at their height, they had forty five thousand workers, and the difficulty was again we've just came out of a major depression. Um, had we not gone to war, we would still have had the, the economic difficulties that we had at the time. Uh, people were illiterate. Education was not something that was pushed. The average education was about sixth grade um, it, because you didn't have that requirement that you had to have high school. High school came after the war. Then it, there was a big push. And also with the GI Bill about being able to get the GIs. And that's where the push also, even though we had community college, that's where the real push came on community college is because it was a way to get people educated that normally couldn't be educated. Um, and, you know, so, and then the nutritional part too was a, a big factor. People were literally starving. That was the other reason that they they pushed victory gardens. It wasn't just because they didn't want to have them consume things that needed to go to the military, is people were starving. And so by having people having home gardens, they at least could make sure that they had fresh vegetables. And of course, we had rationing, so they didn't have access to a lot of meat or sugar. And just a side trivia in Long Beach, um, the, the sugar rationing was conducted by the Long Beach Unified School District, and the person who was in charge of it was Douglas Newcomb, who they called Sugar Daddy, um, <laughs> because of his work. So it, you had your coupons, and um, you, you also, when you went, went to work at Douglas, they gave you rationing coupons. Um, I also learned an interesting story when I was talking to an archivist at, at Douglas, that they would mark some of the rationing coupons bec to detect fraud. Um, so that they knew where these coupons were coming from and whether or not somebody was selling them outside. Um, so they had elaborate... Um, or counterfeiting them. Ca they were counterfeiting them. <laughs> and because there was a huge black market for the rationing yeah. coupons as well as all the other products that people were encouraged to save and then and recycle. Um, so it was a tough time. And the difficulty about when we see World War II movies, it looks very romantic. It just looks, oh, it was just wonderful. It was horrible. It was a horrible time. Everybody was involved, um, and, and I were just talking about this. Everybody in that war w was involved. In the city of Long Beach, the schools, they taught a war curriculum. They had the kids involved in, in volunteering. They raised money for the war stamps. You worked, and not only did these women work, but then they were expected after work to do what was called V-mail. V-mail was to write a letter to a GI, and it was sent to a special machine because it, it cost the uh, United States government so much money to ship all the letters to the cargo that they what they would do is put it into a V machine, and um, then they would, it was a summary, and it was picked up and sent overseas. You were expected to do that. You were expected to volunteer with the Red Cross or, or with your church or something local. And then when you looked at Douglas's newsletters, they had all kinds of activities that they wanted you to do after work. Um, so it, it was- Including it was, blood drives, by the way. It, blood drives constantly and cigarette drives. There's a picture in my book where they, the Douglas women went around and collected money for c cigarettes because you gave them to the guys in the hospital. <laughs> we didn't know. We didn't know better. We didn't know better at the time. But they, they raised it, and, and then there was a picture of them visit, you know, whatever. So it's um, they were expected to do more than just go to work and take for, care of their families. And so it was a rough time for everyone, and it put a lot of social stress. A lot of relationships broke up. Um, a lot of GIs got, you know, dear John letters. 
Um, women got a freedom that they didn't have before the war. Uh, social relationships changed dramatically, and so it was a time of great upheaval. Um, and it was hard to put that genie back in the bottle once the war was over when you told the women, yeah, thanks, but you know, let's just get back to the way it was, because they couldn't get back to that way. No. And it had a great impact. There's a great comment um, by an African-American woman who got a great job, well, like, by the time anyway, working, uh, making, making, uh, making airplanes in Long Beach. Her name is Tina Hill, uh, and this is a comment from her in 1944. Hitler was the one that got us out of white folks' kitchens. <laughs> in other words, the war demands, you know, creates this demand for workers, and so. Okay, questions, anybody have any questions? Can I? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just wondered if you wanted to comment on um, the book on Eleanor Roosevelt, The War Years by Goodwin. Much of what you were saying and talking about reminded me of her book, and I was impressed by how much Eleanor Roosevelt uh, participated and needled Franklin time and time again about social issues. One, well, it, there was a, a snippet where she was actually on the line visiting some women. Um, she was an advocate for women, and she was an advocate not only for women in the workforce, but for women in the armed services. She really advocated for women. The, the, the Army, all the women that went into the services during the war were auxiliaries. They were not considered real um, soldiers. It took um, things later. And she advocated on that and said that that was not appropriate. She also pushed about the WASP, about these women are flying and that women should be allowed to be pilots. And, and, and dying, yeah, flying and dying. 38 of them. And nobody, you know, nobody would pay attention to that. But her focus on civil rights, too, was really dramatic at a time that it wasn't Vast, it wasn't greatly popular, um, but she just stepped up and consistently advocated on behalf of women, which I think um, made a difference. I think women took, took solace in the fact the first lady, by the way, Eleanor Roosevelt came to Long Beach numerous times, before the war and after the war. Um, Long Beach was a very popular place, it still is. Okay, so in the back, John. Uh, Jerry, during your presentation, there was a portion uh, when you were talking about um, the encouraging women to wear clothes that wouldn't, you know, injure them in the workplace. And did that end up? Did, weren't there some fashion changes at the time that came about as a result of that, so that women's work clothes actually became fashionable and they designed clothes right. for women that were more feminine but still allowed them to work efficiently. Absolutely, there was such collusion between Hollywood and what was going on in the war industry that every the movies started to show the same kind of the pleated pants. Uh, Catherine Hepburn wrote war pants. Um, the way that the hair was pulled back up. Um, in my book, I have a page in there. Buffums actually uh, featured uniforms that you could buy to wear at Douglas so that were very fashionable. Nobody had the money. I mean, they basically just took whatever out of their closet. But it did, it had a dramatic impact, and that was the melding, this is the first time we, I think, really had in this country a melding of propaganda. And propaganda is when government uses public relations for a particular purpose. And they melded it in everything. So when you went to the movies, you saw it reinforced that you could be very feminine and wear pants and have your hair pulled back and not necessarily, you know, have all the jewelry that you had before. So there was a real close association. Consequently, when the war ended, the propaganda started again. And so the things in movies, Doris Day, the, the whole 1950s, the whole movement of, you know, what was happening with women, you didn't see women portrayed in the movies as working basically out of the house. It was supporting you know, the husband and the family and having this wonderful new car and refrigerator and stove and all these great things. They, again, colluded within the magazine. Women's magazines were particularly instrumental during the war and after the war to continue um, the prescriptive literature. Uh, this is what women need to do. This is need, how they need to dress. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to know how many people in this room have roasted the roosters in their families and you're sitting on some of these stories and 
Do you remember which shipyard? <clears throat> uh, Craig Shipyard. Craig Shipyards, okay. Well, they worked on the Victory, uh, the Victory ships. Victory ships, yeah. And uh, uh, one one thing that wasn't mentioned was uh, uh, the women that worked who took care of the children. And uh, in my case, uh, I was raised in. Uh, Projects, Carmelitas. Uh, we moved there, I think, 1941. And uh, actually, the, the wage my mother made uh, paid our rent. I think our rent was only like $40 a month. $38 a month. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that was that enabled my father to buy a war bond every every week, and uh, he. Uh, Saved that money during the war and later went into business with that money. Uh, but I remember a lady across the street from us that uh, had five children and uh, she took care of me. Uh, I was the only child. And so uh, my hat's off to Aggie. <laughs> yeah, child care. In the summertime, uh, I went to the uh, Brown Military Academy over on, uh, on Cherry Avenue, and uh, I went there for one year, and uh, I, I don't know, I never asked if my folks were, uh, if that was paid for by uh, the government, or if they had to pay to have me. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, it was private, so. Yeah. One of the things after the research on that. Anyway, uh, my folks, uh, my mother was a uh, she was a uh, cutter. She wasn't a welder. Mm -hmm. She was a cutter. They had these big pieces of metal. Yeah. Pieces, pieces, and they would uh, uh, scrape it with the with the white. I forget what they call it, soapstone. And uh, they'd tell her where to cut. And she would remind me of that picture we saw on the screen. She'd have this hood and uh, she would cut a line. And they, she was really proud that they said that she could cut the straightest line. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there were sparks all over. Yeah, that was dangerous work, very dangerous work. It was very dangerous. Uh, she broke her uh, right angle. Fell into a hole, and she had to be off for like six weeks. And she went back to work, and the first within the first few days, she fell in another hole, broke the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. My father was a uh, pipe fitter. Uh, he worked in the, on the boilers in the ships. Good stories to tell. It's great. And, uh, but they loved it. You know, they were happy. It was happy times. There was a, a real spirit uh, in the United States. Uh, my father was also a uh, area warden in, in the projects. So he had his hat. His his white helmet. A little uniform. He wore. Yeah. Thank Very you. good, thanks. Thank you. Hey, Jim. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that your mother didn't do anything with cut metal. Um, our mother was at the River too, but she worked on optics and helped to put together bomb sites for things. Yes, she did. And I, I just I just acknowledged her in the book on remarkable women of Long Beach for doing that. So, you know, the, the term rifter is a broad term that included all sorts of things, and it kind of had all to working with optics and other kinds of things. So my mother was quite proud of the fact of having participated in, as it was in the river. 
His mother is, is B. Antonor, and B. Antonor, as you, you know, B. B. is a long time um, activist in our community, did a number of things on behalf of children, crosswalks, legal women voters, and she also served on the Rosie the Riveter Foundation, um, and we were very, very pleased we were able to honor her for that. But there are all kinds of Rosies. It's interesting because they call, it, some people said, well, it was Rosie the Riveter, what about the other women? Well, there was Tilly the Toiler, um, and there was Wendy the Welder. Wendy the Welder, yeah, that's right. Uh, and in fact, there's an interesting news article I found in some national press that, that there, they, the other women were complaining that everybody, yeah like the Rosie the Riveter song and was calling all these women Rosie the Riveter and they needed a song. Um, nobody ever else came up with another song, so it, it kind of stuck. And in Canada, in Canada, at a weapons factory, there was, and I'm not making this up, Ronnie the Bren Gun Girl. <laughs> a, a Bren Gun is a British equivalent of a machine gun, so she was in a plant that made machine guns, so she was called Ronnie the Bren Gun Girl in Canada, so. There are a bunch of these people, yeah. If, if you could bear just one second, I'd just like to show you a snippet of a film that the British government put out to get their women to get back into the house yeah. after World War II. Um, and our, our country was doing the very same thing, but you listen to this and it is just, it's unbelievable that it was actually produced by the government and it was being shown all over in communities because they wanted to send a message to women, the war was over, go home. No, no shame at all in this film. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> okay. So that no. continued in the U.S., the same kind of propaganda. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh. It was worse. Go ahead. Um, when the wind was, um, flew planes to the bases, I don't think it had all my suit was a one-way trip. Yeah, what they would do is they would take other ships, other aircraft, and they would fly back. Um, so that there was um, like a lot of the Long Beach uh, wasps flew from here to Palm Springs. Palm Springs has a wonderful air museum, by the way, if you get a chance. Um, but there was a big military base out there. They never were allowed to fly overseas. It was all within the United States to the air bases. But I just a quick little trivia. You know where we got Saran wrap from? We got it from World War II. It was used to wrap the engines that had to be shipped aboard um, ships so they didn't rust. And so then afterwards we found out it always, you could wrap sandwiches too. Yeah. Yeah. I somewhere, maybe at the same way, I was on the East Coast at some point in the war that some women did fly some of the planes overseas. They weren't allowed to um, officially. There were some women who went to England um, to essentially try to enlist and fly with, with the um, English Air Force, but the United States would not allow them. It was a very big pushback. In fact, the WASP were not, were not in existence for more than a couple of years before what was happening is that men were coming back from service and they were complaining that women were now taking their jobs as pilots. Um, and so there was pressure put on Congress and Congress dismantled them. And Mary Thwaites, who was 92, um, was actually in the last class of WASP. She never got to fly as a WASP, um, but she went on and did commercial flight um, uh, for many years and then worked in Germany doing some other things. So it was important to these women that they be able to get the recognition to be just like military service. They wore uniforms, but they had to buy them themselves. They, in fact, the families had to pay for their caskets to be sent home when they died because there was no benefit, um, no funeral benefit. Um, and the women had to get them from themselves from place to place. So if they took a plane someplace, then they, it was on them to find out how to get back to their base. Um, and it wasn't, there's a wonderful documentary out there um, where current women pilots with the Air Force are acknowledging the WASP and how important it was of what they did because it really opened the door uh, for women to be able to fly in the military. Yeah. I was thinking, listening to all this, that women after the war continued, those that were not women's um, I know there was a group of, a group of women that were in like circumstances, widows with children, and there was no provisions for children. And they worked with uh, Craig Costa yeah. and uh, passed the bill. And my mother received $25 for 
child. So she got seventy-five dollars a month for the, the three of them, her three children. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was seventy-five dollars more than she had before. Than she had before. So, yeah, there, there. I mean, the U.S. government. This idea of providing for veterans and war widows and children, orphans, is very long time developing. I mean, the Civil War, World War I, I mean, we're talking now about the 1940s, 1950s, even 1960s, before that kind of legislation was considered proper. So that's always a big issue in war. We're eager to send people off to war, but then don't care so much when they come back. You see that the way veterans are treated, for example. And, yeah. this, and the sad part about the child care, I know the gentleman mentioned about different people taking care of them. Um, as soon as the war was over, the government came out with these reports about the rise of juvenile delinquency and that they attributed it to women not being in the home or women not being attentive to the kids. And so instead of addressing it by coming up with programs, it was one more thing on look at what you did because you left your house, even though we told you you should, and now your, your, your kids were delinquent because there was no supervision, because there was no child care um, at, at a certain age, and friends and neighbors helped out a lot, um, and, but you know, women, so women got hit over the head about that as well, so that was, it, even with the veterans who had children, the, the provisions for uh, allotments were very minimal, very minimal. They did not make much money in the military service, um, and so some of their families were starving at home because they weren't able to send home a decent amount of money, um, and we've historically, we're, the other day we were having a conversation with somebody, and they remarked that, you know, they're people in the military currently now who are in food stamps. Um, they have to be because they, they, their significant other spouse, whatever, doesn't get paid enough um, for them to be in the service of their country. So it's, um, we still haven't grappled with it. We kind of romanticize war, uh, but we've yet to take care of the after effects of it um, and really focus attention. So. You know, hopefully, our generation, this generation that's in the service now, um, can really push on that more. It really is unconscionable that we ask people to serve and then we don't take care of them. Yes. Well, there's a huge irony that, given all this, that the Japanese Americans were interned when all that labor was needed for the war effort, and actually, some people did get released to do harvesting. And some factory work in the Midwest. Yeah. Yeah, a few thousand people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, irony abounds in wartime. Yeah, you know, that's so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, anything else? Anything uh, else? Well, thank you very much for okay, coming. Thanks for coming.